So our last speaker for today is Raj Kumar. He's going to be talking with us about material science and engineering. So I encourage you to think about how you might use chemistry and various sorts of engineering in material science engineering, what sort of the interplays between all these things might be. All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah, uh, my name is Raj Kumar. Uh, I'm a lecturer and the director of undergraduate studies in our materials science and engineering department. Um, it's really nice to be here in person. Um, last couple times we've done this for Engineering One students, it's been on Zoom, so it's a lot nicer, I think, to be in front of you all here today. Um, and uh, kind of following up from some of the comments earlier, I have a quick poll. Uh, before you enrolled in this class, raise your hand if you had ever heard of what materials science and engineering is. Okay, this is getting better and better every year. It looks like maybe half or a little more than half, which is great. Um, for all of you who didn't have your hand raised, that was me. When I was uh, my first quarter of undergrad, I had no idea what material science and engineering is. So uh, like many of you, uh, I was in your shoes and I ended up kind of finding this major and getting really excited about it. So I'll just take a few minutes to kind of explain why it might be for you. Just a quick overview, since um, several of you hadn't heard of what material science and engineering is all about. What we really care about is understanding how the structure of the materials that we use all the time influence the properties that we care about. So what do I mean by structure? What do I mean by properties? Well, it turns out that the way that individual atoms are arranged or groups of atoms create a nanostructure or what the chemical structure might be, or the electronic structure of a material might be, dramatically influences how it performs mechanically, electrically, chemically, biologi biologically, thermally, et cetera. And if we can tune what the structure of those materials are, and we can characterize what that structure actually is, then we can set what its properties and ultimate performance might be. Okay? Conversely, uh, as an engineer, which I am, which is really fun and we get to do, we get to say, well, you know, wouldn't it be great if my iPhone could be charged once a week instead of once a day? Or my electric vehicle could drive 1,000 miles instead of 300 miles, right? That's what's called a performance benchmark. And if we set some goals and means approach of kind of looking at material science and engineering, we can figure out and back kind of track what are the properties, what is the structure, and what is the way we can process materials to get to that benchmark to achieve our, our goals that we care about. So this is the approach that we take, regardless of if we're interested in designing better batteries, we're designing healthcare technologies, uh, we're designing novel uh, electronic structures uh, and devices, all sort of fields of material science uh, and engineering touch a lot of the different applications that we care about in society. So uh, when you might ask the question, where is material science and engineering? I could tell you physically where it is on campus, not too far from here, but I think what matters more is where it touches all of the different amazing applications that Stanford students uh, and faculty get to work on and get to really tackle. So regardless if you're interested in materials for energy storage, materials for computing and electronics, biomedical devices, uh, medical diagnostics, manufacturing, and many, many other topics and disciplines, uh, we do research and we collaborate and connect with others on campus to solve some of these really important grand challenges in science and engineering. So um, I want to walk through just two quick applications with you today. I'd walk through so many more because I think they're really exciting, but in the short amount of time, I'll just have two for you today. So uh, on the topic of, of batteries that, that John already brought up uh, just a moment ago, um, if you look at the, the battery pack that's in a Tesla or the battery that's in your uh, smartphone or laptops that you have in front, front of you, uh, who can tell me what's the ion that's traveling back and forth in the battery? Lithium. lithium. Yes, lithium. All of the batteries we use are lithium ion batteries. That's right. Okay. And so if you take apart that, that battery pack uh, uh, that John showed for the iPhone, and you take a look at the negative electrode that's called the anode. It will look something like this, okay? It has a copper, typically current collector, which is just this big block film. And it has this porous composite that's made of carbon and a polymeric binder that kind of sticks things together and a few other additives in there as well. And this is what allows sort of lithium to shuttle back and forth from anode to cathode to charge and discharge that battery that's in your smartphone and your laptop um, in your electric vehicle. 
So it, it turns out that lithium is right, the third element on the periodic table. We saw the periodic table a few moments ago. Um, and lithium, that means it's a really, really small ion. Okay, it's really hard to see. How do you see lithium? Well, it turns out there's these set of techniques known as X-ray characterization techniques that allow us to visualize the movement of ions back and forth. So I have a little bit of a video here. This is uh, courtesy of Professor uh, Will Chu, uh, a faculty in our department. Uh, his group does a lot of cutting edge research on new battery technologies. And what they were interested in this study was seeing does the shape of these carbon particles, those are the ones that store the lithium, lithium essentially stack in between the layers of carbon. Is there a, a sort of relationship between the size and the shape of these particles and how lithium ends up going in and out to charge and discharge the battery? So what you're seeing here is that these carbon particles are fully lithiated. Okay, they have sort of super sat or saturated with lithium. And as this battery essentially is run, we can see the lithium leaving in each of these individual particles to the point where at the end, all the lithium has been extracted and removed. Okay. Anybody notice anything curious about this picture? Anyone? Yeah, in the back. Different shapes go green at varying rates, and then at the very end it goes quite far. Yeah, varying rates, and then they all sort of go away at the end. And what you'll notice as well, it's an excellent observation, what you'll also notice, right, is that the lithium doesn't get removed continuously across the entire particle, right? There are hot spots, right? Certain spots go green first. So what that means is that there are preferential sites for lithium to leave these carbon particles. And what this showed Professor Chu's team is that if you tailor the surface structure or the morphology of these carbon particles, maybe there's a way to make it easier for lithium ions to shuttle back and forth. What could that lead to? Well, potentially batteries that charge and discharge more efficiently. Um, and so that when you go to uh, your charging station, maybe instead of an hour to charge, it only takes 10 minutes or something like that, right? So this was an initial study that they've really uh, uh, worked on a lot more in the last few years to show that the structure of the things that go inside our battery anodes have a key impact on their properties and performance of those batteries that we care about. Okay, so one more example that I wanna quickly go through is uh, I, I, again, uh, my background is in, in batteries and energy materials, but over the last few years, like many of you, I've gotten really interested in biology and really interested in uh, healthcare especially. And so uh, several of our faculty in our department work on materials for healthcare, for health diagnostics, for uh, biomedical uh, uh, implants and many other applications. Um, and so one of these uh, applications comes from Professor uh, Guasong Hong's lab where his group is really interested at trying to probe the brain and trying to understand how do those neural functions in our brain really work. And it turns out that has a lot of important applications in neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, so I, my, I have a family member uh, with Alzheimer's and so that's a big uh, important thing for me to understand and, and think about. And so the idea is, well, what if we could create probes that go directly into our brain? Now it turns out in order to do that, we need probes that essentially match the mechanical properties of your brain tissue. And your brain's kind of soft, so if you stick an electronic probe or a needle in that, that's going to be a little bit of a problem. So what if we design conductors that are as soft as water and can float? So this is an example of injectable copper films that can actually be injected into the brain and monitor electronic activity so you can measure neural activity and maybe figure out something along the lines of what sort of is going wrong when we have these neurodegenerative diseases? What is the impact in our neural function? With the sort of broader idea that eventually you could create these networks of injectable sort of copper probes and really understand again what the overall function is of the brain to treat uh, disease and potentially even regain motor function for folks who suffer from paralysis or, or other uh, you know, loss of spinal or, or neural uh, activity as well. 
So these are just two examples of where material science and engineering shows up. There are many, many more. Um, and unfortunately, I can't talk to you all about them today, but I would love to. So come uh, stop by and chat with me. Um, really, really briefly, uh, our department is a, a department of 22 faculty, about 40 undergraduates, many, many more uh, graduate students, and we have lots of different classes offered um, throughout the year. And I think what makes this great is our department culture really combines everyone together. We have lots of different events where you see faculty, graduate students, postdocs, undergrads, all together um, and getting to, to chat about some of the things that they're passionate about and, and interested in. Um, we have a really vibrant undergraduate community. Um, so hopefully, I think these slides will get shared later so you don't have to write any of these links down, but we have a great undergraduate student organization, SUMS, um, that puts on study nights, uh, uh, guest speaker, uh, uh, and different uh, industry tours and, uh, and other great events for you to learn more about our department culture, meet some of our fellow students, and get connected to our broader sort of materials community. Uh, this question I get asked a lot, where do math sci majors go? Uh, and the answer really is everywhere and anywhere. Um, whether you're interested in going into big uh, companies like Intel and SpaceX and Tesla and Apple, whether you're interested in working at startup ventures in, again, the biomedical space, the energy space, the electronic computing space, um, going to graduate school, working at national labs, education, public policy, we have students go everywhere and anywhere. Um, so a material science and engineering degree can really take you to a lot of great places. Uh, we have some great courses offered uh, for students who are interested in just checking out what is material science and engineering. Um, so one of them that I'm going to highlight briefly right now is MATSI 10, but there's many others out there. Uh, MATSI 10 is a class that actually I teach uh, this fall, and it's a way, maybe some of you are already enrolled in the class, which is great, um, but it's a way for you to learn more about where are the career opportunities in material science and engineering. And, and I talked earlier about how our major is really interdisciplinary, and that really shows from the speakers that we invite. Um, they talk routinely about whether they work in the fields of energy and sustainability, biomaterials, regenerative medicine, atomic scale sort of engineering for electronics and nanotechnology. They work with so many different other engineers, scientists, technologists, uh, economists, business leaders as well uh, to make the cutting edge technologies that we rely on every day and that we hope to, to bring uh, here in the near future to help solve, again, some of these really important challenges. Um, last thing I want to kind of uh, end with is a lot of our students uh, really, get in, uh, really take a liking to getting involved in research while they're here at Stanford. Um, I think it's, research is a great way to supplement your learning in classes by getting to do things that are hands-on and getting some really uh, great opportunities to work with graduate students and faculty on some of these cutting-edge problems that I, I briefly talked about. So we have a great uh, uh, MATSI RU program, which is over the summer. You get paid to come do research at Stanford over the summer and get to uh, work in a cohort of about 20 of your peers on a really uh, wide variety of different research topics. Um, and we recently started last year this undergraduate research grants program, this URG program. So this is a way to get paid to do research in the winter and spring quarter for about 10 hours a week or so for the two quarters. Happy to chat about you, uh, chat with you about that in the, in the Q&A. Okay, so really quick, why did I choose material science and engineering? Remember I told you I, I took an intro level course on scanning electron microscopes? These are the pictures that I took as an 18 year old that I got to actually see what a vinyl record looks like under an electron microscope. This is a vinyl record, so if you are into uh, like 70s uh, audio media and have a vinyl collection, um, this is what it looks like uh, at the sort of micron scale. Um, and this is the shiny side of a compact disc, okay? So the back side. So this shows you how we read and write uh, uh, data on a compact disc. So it was being able to get to see what these sort of traditional materials that you see you know, with your eyes uh, on a daily scale, what they look like deep down and how it informs how we make these structures to impact the properties and performance that we use on these materials every single day. And by getting involved in MATSI, uh, I was really exposed to an interdisciplinary way of thinking, which I think really matters in solving some, again, these cutting edge problems and that we face today. So with that, um, these are some reasons why you might choose material science and engineering. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more. Thank you so much for your attention. Really appreciate it.